I mean, it's awesome. That's how I grew my business. And like, even to this day, like every single opportunity that I have, that's like a really cool opportunity. I can tie back to like a specific strategic gift that I work for free. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world insider podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. Well, hey there, passion maker. This is Miriam Shulman, host of the Inspiration Place podcast. You're listening to episode number 143. I am so grateful that you're here. Today, we're talking all about NFTs. And what the F are NFTs? And how do you sell them? But even if you don't care about NFTs or aren't aren't sure if you should care about NFTs, I want you to tune into this interview anyway, because in this interview, you're also going to learn how this artist skyrocketed his career when he became laser focused on his niche, how he used LinkedIn to market his art and how to use strategic gifting of your art to build your collector base. There were so many juicy nuggets in today's interview. I can't wait for you to tune in. Today's guest is a pop portrait artist for professional athletes. He's worked with over 400 athletes in all of the major initial categories. NFL, NBA, WNBA, MLB, MLS, PLL, basically all of them. And he's also a licensed artist for Tops, currently working on his third top set. I, I think those are baseball cards. I'm not sure. Earlier this year, he also began releasing his artwork as NFTs, and that's how he came to my attention. Recently, he also collaborated with Terrell Owens to bring the T.O. Museum and Gallery to life. Please welcome to the Inspiration Place, Blake Jamieson. Well, hey there, Blake. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to have you. I was looking around for somebody to come to the podcast to talk about NFTs. And a friend of mine pointed me in the direction of the profile that, was it CNBC? Mm -hmm. Did on you. Yeah. And I was like, this guy's really cool. (laughs) Thank you. In many ways. It was awesome. And that that project or that like feature, I guess, has opened a lot of doors for me, which is exciting. Yeah. And thank you for coming here now that you're like TV famous. You still do <laughs> podcasts. I was just in a local newspaper in my hometown in Marin County, California. And my mom was at 7-Eleven yesterday and just like flipping through and she like saw, you know, my big picture, you know, so to me, like that's more special, I guess, than like, you know, the more like national coverage I got with CNBC. Yeah. That make your mom proud coverage or yeah, or exactly. show off to the high school. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hometown hero. That's right. Yeah. So let's get started with what is an NFT. And I just want to share with you, my husband this morning says, what does it stand for? I said, that will not help you. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. NFTs, a very hot topic right now. So NFT stands for non-fungible token. What that means is fungible means like interchangeable for something else. So if something is non-fungible, it means that it is completely unique. And that's identified by this, consider it like a serial number that lives on the internet. And a particular portion of the internet, which is called the blockchain, which is kind of what manages all of these digital items. Could be a picture, it could be a video, it could be music. We're really just the tip of the iceberg on what NFTs could be. What the technology makes possible is we end up with something that is provable to be authentic, meaning that somebody could go forge the perfect Picasso painting. And to get that verified, they would have to take that to, you know, the estate or an appraiser or an authenticator. And like, it's a process, but it's still a manual process of like somebody looking, saying this is a real Picasso or not. With NFTs, we have this serial number that lives on the internet that is on this completely transparent ledger. So you can see every transaction that happens. So like we know that it's authentic and that is one piece of the puzzle. The other part of the puzzle is that it's provably scarce. Like that is the one, you know, it's non-fungible, but even if, for example, I could do an NFT edition where I do three versions and each are serial numbered, number one of three, two of three, three of three, those again, 
like even though there's three of them, they still have their unique non-fungible token kind of attributes. And so it, it means that like everything is like provably authentic and provably scarce. And when those two things come together in the art world, that leads to demand. Okay. And now that everyone's thoroughly confused, by the way, it's I know, very, I know, very I know. I'm sorry. No, no. It is. It's it very is. confusing. And I, I don't normally drop this on the podcast, but I actually went to MIT and I still have a huge problem understanding NFTs, like huge. Like, so it's like, even people like me, it's so, mm -hmm. it's really an abstract thing. And what I tried to explain to my husband, and I do think he got it. So this is a funny story. So after I said to him, non-fungible token, and he looked at me funny. I said, well, basically, when we, we have a dollar bill that's printed, we all agree that that represents a certain amount of value of gold that's in the bank. Right. So what artists are doing is we're creating artwork and we are agreeing that it represents a value. Mm -hmm. And then my husband said, oh, so you mean like shrewd bucks? <laughs> it is kind of like shrewd bucks. <laughs> I was like, exactly. Yeah, That's exactly it totally what it is. It's exact. Yeah. I mean, it, it is. And, it, you know, it's interesting because, like I said, like we're so new to the space that we don't know what it is. And right now people are thinking, okay, it's a JPEG, right? It's a picture of my art. And that could happen in many forms. Like I've done NFTs where like whoever buys the NFT gets the physical painting. And part of that is to onboard people because people have a hard time grasping, right? Like, what is this kind of new thing? And like, why is it worth owning? There's a couple comparisons that I'll make depending on like where people are coming from. So if they're like young and they play video games, I'll talk about like buying skins. Counter-Strike, for example, is like a shooting game and you can buy skins for your guns. So like your gun will look, could look like it's purple or, or something like that. It doesn't change what the, what the item does in the game. It just makes you look cool. Anyway, the younger generation kind of get that of like, it, they want to go and purchase these digital items so that they can flex kind of with their friends in their digital world. And as like all of us are becoming more and more digital, now people are saying, okay, I'm going to have a digital art collection. I think in the future, you're going to walk into a hotel room and you're going to have an app on your phone and all the walls are going to be covered in monitors and you can pull up the app and you can like click a button and set up all of your favorite art in your hotel room and feel like you're at home. And so I think that's going to be really interesting when NFTs start mixing with the real world. I also think that NFTs are going to shake up the way that we do like ticketing and like access to events. Again, because of this like provable authenticity and provable scarcity, I think a company like StubHub is going to move completely over to NFTs. There's no reason that you need to hold a ticket anymore. We don't need to print them. Oh, interesting. I think. And, and like they'll probably offer like physical tickets for a very long time as like an option, but you might even have to like pay extra, like getting a, a bag at the grocery store costs 10 cents. Like, oh, you want an actual ticket? Okay, you have to pay a little extra. If you could explain how you actually sold your NFTs. I, I, I remember in that CNBC clip, you said, mm -hmm. Hey, I took this piece of artwork. So could you explain like what you did? Sure. And maybe how much you made? No problem. There's a lot of different platforms to sell your NFTs on. I was fortunate that I was kind of tipped off to a platform called super rare about a year ago, a curated platform, mm -hmm. meaning that they're extremely, especially now that NFTs have blown up, they're like very, it's hard to get approved as an artist, no matter how awesome your art is, like they just have such a backlog. So I got in there really early. And that that was like a stroke of luck, I think that helped with the numbers that we'll get to and such. But I essentially just started taking pictures of, you know, old art from my archive. And in the case that you're talking about, this was a kind of a long, skinny, abstract piece that I had made in 2018, actually is a collaboration with a, a fellow artist and a friend of mine. I never really did anything with the piece. And when NFTs came out, I was kind of looking at what was popular or what I thought was popular, which isn't necessarily the best way to do things. I was just doing that because I was curious. And I saw this a lot of kind of this like surreal kind of trippy abstracty kind of vibe. And so that made me think of this piece. And so I pulled it out and I took high res photos of sections of it. Because again, the piece is like six feet long by like, you know, eight inches tall. And so it's hard to get like a photo that captures everything. But if I really zoom in and get macro shots, I was able to get like 10 sections of it. And that created 10 pieces of artwork with separate Correct. sales for each one. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, each of them end up being different artworks, but all abstract, same colors, same vibe, because they're all from the same piece. And then I started putting those out one at a time. And the way that it works on super rare is you can put up a piece and then people can just bid whatever they want. And then as the owner, I can either accept it or I can just wait. 
And if I wait, there's a little bit of risk that they could withdraw their bid, but also other people will see it and could bid higher. And so usually I'd be putting something up. If I get a bid quickly that I am happy with, and at that time it was 0.5 Ethereum, which is crypto, the currency basically that we're using on, on Super Rare and for most NFTs is called Ethereum. The interesting thing there too is that Ethereum's value changes. So like when I accepted half an Ethereum then, that was probably only worth about $800 US. But to me, that was a good price. Now with Ethereum at $3,500, that same half Ethereum is worth, you know, seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars mm. Since I keep as much money as I can in Ethereum, it means that like this piece that I sold two, three months ago for what at the time was $800 now is actually worth $1,700 to me. So that even that helps even more. So Ethereum's that is basically like Bitcoin. Yes. Think of it just like Bitcoin. It's just a different, like a dollar and a peso or a dollar and a Canadian dollar, whatever. I mean, they're, they have their own values. Okay. And then once again, I just want to reiterate that the way Bitcoin, Ethereum, the currency works, it's the same. I, it's really the same thing that we have now. We all agree that a dollar is worth a certain amount. And it's the same thing with these digital currencies is that money is an abstract thing that we've all agreed has a certain value and that value changes. Totally. Okay. Especially as NFTs became started to become more and more popular and at least like maybe not understood yet, but people are were aware of. I was just in a right place at the right time where I kept putting up art and it was pretty consistently selling between uh, half an Ethereum and one Ethereum peaking at a piece that I sold for three Ethereum, which also came with the physical painting. And so that's great. You know, three Ethereum is about $10,000 right now. A painting that that size, I would normally sell for probably six or $7,000. So like I was able to increase kind of the perceived value of my physical artwork by attaching an NFT to it as well. And I think that's a great place for artists to start, especially with, you know, getting your collectors excited about it because even if like you get a really good grasp on it and you're ready to go for it, it's still really challenging to explain it to collectors and get them to also figure out how to actually be able to buy your NFT and support you. It's not an easy process. And that's why it's not a widely adopted thing yet is because there's too much friction to bring on the consumers. And so I think if you do it and you are just getting into it and your customers are used to getting your physical art, I would recommend putting as much physical art kind of tie-ins into your NFTs and you can get your feet wet that way and also have enough of a cool offering to get your art buyers to actually like sign up for, you know, an Ethereum wallet. And, you know, I get, that's a whole separate conversation that we could get into, but I'm scared to get into it. I really am. I know. All right. One thing that I really like about what you just shared is Blake as I said in the introduction, also has a digital marketing background. And one of the things that makes you successful as an artist is how you're able to pull in these concepts from the marketing space. So for example, the way you said, oh, you buy this NFT, which is, as we talked about, it's basically a representation of of currency. You get this print or a original as a bonus. Yeah. And as a flip side to that, my plan for as this 2021 continues, eventually every single person that buys a physical painting from me and has an, one of my artworks is going to get a parallel NFT, which will be the certificate of authenticity. And so that'll act, that's going to be a little bit different because right now I have a physical, you know, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that has all the information. It has a photograph of the painting. It has my signature. It has my little, I actually call it the clampy stamp. It's like, it's a paper, but you know, I've had people lose them. I've had people spill coffee on them. I've had people, you know, tell me it never arrived with the painting, even though they're taped to the back of every painting, you know, all all kinds of stuff. If, if I have an NFT version of it and it's like, that's it. And that's like provable authentic. You know, if I become wildly popular and somebody wants to try and copy my artwork, it's not that hard because I'm an open book. Like I, everything I do, I do on YouTube. Everybody that asks me questions of how do you do this? How did you make this line? How did you make this texture? Like I, I just tell people, like I don't have any trade secrets. Mm. Same thing with like certificates of authenticity. And like, I think my paintings are cool, but they're not like, you know, I don't spend years on a painting that somebody could practice and replicate my work. I'm excited that NFTs like is going to protect kind of my brand 
even if I get so big that like my art is actually being forged, which I would consider flattering, I suppose, but like could actually be a problem if I didn't have a way of like dealing with it, I guess. Trust me, Blake, there are already artists in China copying your art. Great. You may not have found them yet, but they are out there. If I could meet people, I've, I've thought about doing a contest where I, I give people like all the files that I'm using to make something to cut my stencils and say like, whoever can do this as close to the way that I did it can have a job basically. It's not a bad idea. I mean, that is really how many of the biggest artists we know of in art history built their careers because they didn't do it alone. They had a studio workshop, even even Leonardo, like Salvador Mundi was the most expensive painting. They say most of it wasn't done by Leonardo. It was done by his his students. Yep. And as I especially like, I mean, my art business is growing now and I have a lot of help that I didn't have, you know, I was a one man shop for a very long time. Now I've got a half a dozen employees, some part-time, some full-time, and some of them help, you know, in the creative process. I'm pretty particular. Like I'm, I'm definitely like doing the lion's share of anything that's being shipped to a client, but I'm also starting to realize the power of delegation and like, and more of being a art director and being kind of a curator of a project. And I'm really interested in like doing projects like that. And so you know, even with recent NFT projects, I did one that it was a NFT gallery and museum for Terrell Owens, who is a Hall of Fame football player, awesome guy also. And rather than just saying, okay, I'm going to make all the art for this and try and like, get this credit or get this money or get this anything. I'm like, all right, I'm going to bring in all my homies and all the artists that I've been wanting to work with for a long time. And so we had eight artists, each contributing a piece, we all split all the money evenly. That's been really fun. And so I think that like, being able to kind of branch out now and do these like larger scale projects that have other artists that are all contributing makes me much more open to saying, yeah, I mean, if I could find someone that's like on brand with what I'm doing and I can give them a direction here and then I do half the painting and they do half the painting, I'm fine signing my name on that. One thing that you said is super important and I want to like put a highlighter pen right across it is that you have six people working for you. And so many people have that idea that they have to do it alone, that the artist does it themselves and successful artists really don't. Can you share with us your team of about, you said, I'm sure some of them Mm -hmm. are contractors and there are not Mm -hmm. all employees. What is it that they do for you and what are, what are the roles if you can? Sure. So I would say the backbone of my whole business is actually my sister, which is awesome. She's four years younger than me. She lives in California uh, near my parents. She has two kids, you know, stay at home mom. Yeah, I hired her to help manage all my communications. So she does my email inboxes, my scheduling, all my social media inboxes. We do community, which is this like texting app, my email newsletter, like any communications, whether it's like outbound to my customers or to, or to potential customers, or it's inbound requests for my time or my attention is like filtered through her. And she is by far the best bang for my buck. I mean, I, I pay her well because also she gets to work from home at whatever, whenever she wants, she needs a day off or she needs an after. It doesn't matter. Like I just know that she'll handle business. If I could go back, that would have been the very first hire I made. I think she was like the third before that I hired two in studio helpers. Those guys are part-time. They were full-time for like six to eight months last year outside of NFTs for a little bit of context. I also have a licensing deal with tops baseball cards and I make art that tops turns into baseball cards. And then I take those baseball cards and sign them then sell them as a separate arm of my business. And so the studio help was primarily managing that workflow, whether it's like inbound orders that I need to like sign cards for, or like shipping those cards out to customers. We have my dad also, like I said, it's a family business. He's a computer programmer. He built my website which is completely custom. And, you know, now we have a lot of plans of potentially making pay with Ethereum possible for like buying my artwork physical, because I really believe in this kind of this new technology. My son came to me, he's my son's in his early 20s. And he's he has like this side, he's 20, actually, he's just 20. Yeah. So he yeah. has this side gig where he gets people it makes it sound like it's a sleazy thing. It's not at all. He gets people yeah. to pay him to do nutrition and, you know, personal training things. But he mm-hmm. was telling me, I'm going to build a website. And it's going to be all built with Ethereum and NFTs. And there's going to be no currency. And I was like, hey, slow down, cowboy. <laughs> Why yeah. don't you just put out your website first? But what you're saying is that, no, this is a legit thing. Why it's the reason to do it that way? Well, if I was doing a brand new website and trying to launch my personal brand online, I wouldn't do it like cryptocurrency first. 
I just have like an established site that I've already like built out and just adding a secondary payment option, I think is like advantageous. I wouldn't make my painting site only take Ethereum. Well, that's what he was saying. I was like, are you sure? Anybody that wants to pay me should be able to pay me in whichever currency they want, as long as it has this agreed upon value that that we've talked about, right? And a few times. So I don't care if they pay me in yen, as long as it's enough to like cover the amount of money I want for the painting, or they can pay me in, you know, pesos or Ethereum or Bitcoin or dollars. And I don't want to cut off the important conversation we're having also. So you have your sister, your dad, you have studio helpers, and then to round it out, who else do you have helping? I have a full-time accountant. Honestly, like my business blew up last year, basically like 800% from the previous year to like the next year. It was my biggest year by far. And and probably last year will be bigger than than this year, just because of this like pocket I caught with the tops cards. So full-time accountant who also kind of like if accounting needs are low, he doubles as a studio assistant. He's also a painter, which is amazing. So he's like the closest to like, if I need hands-on help preparing a stencil or something, he can help me do that. And then I have two people that are completely remote. I've never met in real life and both live overseas. And one is a graphic designer and one is a 3D animator and video editor kind of does both. What we end up with is like a really well-rounded team of a lot of like cool, creative people, you know, and we're all having fun and making some good money together. So it's good. I love that. You're creating a village. Trying. Compound. You came from the digital marketing background. What I was really impressed with was how you narrowed in on a niche and then you switched to an even better niche. I don't want to tell the story for you, though. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about that. And then I also want to talk about how you market on LinkedIn, because I think that is huge. For sure. So I quit my corporate marketing job at the age of 30. I was doing very well financially, but not happy, looking forward to Fridays dreading Mondays, that kind of thing. So I quit my job, ultimately started painting full time. Since I didn't go to art school, it took me a while to feel comfortable actually selling my art. And so for a long time, almost a year, I just painted every single day, tried to get in my 10,000 hours as fast as I could, and posted my work online. And as people would say, Hey, I want to buy this, I'd say, Oh, I'm not ready to sell it yet. But I'll let you know when I'm ready. Eventually, when I was comfortable, I put up 10 paintings for sale 500 bucks each, those sold out extremely quickly which was very encouraging to do like 5k on my first day ever selling art uh, online. It's incredible. Yeah. So like that was like super encouraging. And then I continued to kind of sell work here and there. And I've always treated this like a business and wanted to be running a business, not just like a solo artist. And not that there's anything wrong with if that is your ambition to be a one man shop solo artist and do that full time. That's that. I wanted to grow a brand and build a business. I highly discourage people wanting to be one man anything, by the way, mm. in case you haven't figured that out, get an assistant. Yeah. Even no, if it's for sure. a teenage, for sure. teenager on the list in your neighborhood. For sure. But you know, I, I mean, I spent a long time solo. And so, and this was during that time. And so because I knew I had these bigger ambitions, I wanted to focus my art in a particular niche. And so what I did is I looked at all of my existing sales, which at the time was probably 20 paintings, 10 of which from that very first initial sale, and then the other 10 maybe dripped out over the course of the next few months. I looked at each of those customers, and then I made a spreadsheet of what do they do? Where do they work? Where do they live? How do I know them? And it was pretty like very consistent where it's like they work in some type of tech company usually like marketing, PR, advertising, and I know them through social media. It just clicked to me to be like, okay, well, these people all work in offices. So I'm going to be the guy that makes super dope office art. And my ideal customer is going to be a a company who's going from, you know, maybe just raise a series A round. They're moving out of a co-working space into their own office for the first time. They want some cool artwork on the wall. That's not just like buying it from Ikea. They want to show that they have cool culture I thought I could be that guy. Blake, let me ask you something. I mean, I know that you analyzed your customers. and I trust you. That is the information you got. But were you sure that that's they were all putting the art that they were collecting from you in their no. office? Okay, no. you just decided no. that. Yeah, I just decided it. I do know that that some of them put it in their actual office and some of it were solo entrepreneurs that put it in their home office. And And I also realized that like, it's not like those were my customers because I had this pool of like, 
I didn't have a pool of everybody. And then those were the ones that liked my work. It's like, that was my pe- That was my tribe. Those were my people, right? Those were the people you were already connected with. So it was kind of like had a, exactly. a bias built in bias or whatever it's called. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Like confirmation bias or whatever it's called. But I recognize that, but I also recognize I'm like, okay, well, these are my people. Like, what can I make that's going to attract right. them? Right? right. And so I, you know, pivoted pretty hard and said, I'm going to dig my heels in and this is going to be my niche. I updated, you know, my LinkedIn profile and all my social profiles to say as such. But also, I know we we talked about the LinkedIn thing separately, but this is when I use LinkedIn the heaviest is I was thinking, okay, now that I'm going to focus on these people and these customers, where should I find them? Instagram seems like the obvious choice for arts related stuff, but I'm thinking, well, no, if I want to if I want to find the decision makers in the business, you know, if this is where I want to get my art, where do those people hang out? Those are the facilities managers or, you know, building managers or I mean, sometimes for small companies like the CEO or, you know, VP or whatever, it could be the head people of the company. I didn't think that Instagram or Twitter was going to be the easiest for me to kind of cut through the other noise and competition. And so I really focused in on LinkedIn and was just putting out content there, engaging, you know, in other people's content and just making it really easy of like to see what I do, not because I tell you what I do, but just because you read it in my description. I love the way you like zigged or whatever that expression is you zagged or zigged when mm-hmm. you know you see everyone's doing this but wait a minute there was this huge opportunity you 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 notice and mm-hmm. i'm going to ask all the questions i know my listeners are going to have now so great and there's two things you said here that was really important one was you said you created content for linkedin so the content that i was putting on linkedin was similar to what you would see artists at the time putting on instagram or twitter or youtube so like it was time-lapse videos of me painting. It's here's me in the studio working. It's a photograph of my art. I mean, definitely there were some people that are like, what are you doing this on LinkedIn? But like, there's also like 20 other comments to be like, that's dope. I never see art on LinkedIn. Really cool to see this here. Yeah. I mean, the content was all the same stuff that I would be posting on Facebook. I just really focused on LinkedIn. Like, you know, people say, oh, you should post once a day on Instagram if you want to be successful and tweet three times a day if you, you know, or whatever. There's all these like quote unquote best practices. Nobody's saying like, go put your art three times a day on LinkedIn. And so if you do that, it's really easy to actually stand out. And people are like, whoa, yeah, you know, and then you get more attention. Yeah. And then it's all like this funnel where like, it's not pushy at all. Like I never asked for sales on LinkedIn. I just put in my bio, I make art for offices, DM me for commission requests. You know, you can have your featured little things. I would have like pictures of art related to offices. So I had like a Steve Jobs portrait that I'd done. I had a Gary Vaynerchuk portrait that I had done. I had like a motivational quote that says like, you know, hustle never sleeps kind of thing. Like, you know, a painting of that. All of those conversations that ended up, some of them turned into collectors were started because like they reached out to me over DMs because I engaged with them in the public sector without doing any selling, just saying like, congratulations on raising your A round. Like that, like it could be something as simple as that. Yeah, that was my second question because you had said that you engaged in other people's content. Mm -hmm. Well, you just said what that looked like, but how much time did you spend engaging with other people on LinkedIn? I mean, less than an hour a day. Okay. But some time every day. Got it. It was intermittent. It was good timing because, you know, LinkedIn was kind of out of style for a long time and then like came back into style a few years ago. Like they had redone their mobile app this is all right around the same time. And like LinkedIn was just starting to kind of become cool again. And so, yeah, I mean, I was just using the app and I'd be in the studio and I just like you would do on like your Instagram story, you know, you're in the studio, you're working on a piece, you like where it's at, you take a picture, you put it on your story, say work in progress. I would just do that on LinkedIn. And then anytime that I like uploaded content, I would just like go to my feed, like a few posts. I see something cool. I comment, I see a cool achievement. I congratulate them, like just basic stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, I I noticed the shift with LinkedIn because my husband thinks he's too good for social media. So he has Mm. actually he's recently added a few accounts simply because my son is on there. My daughter's on there. But he was he has no Facebook. I think he has Instagram. He maybe had got Twitter just to follow my son when he was in wrestling. Oh, wrestling. I I was a wrestler, too. Really? Oh, wait. Yeah. So I was a little guy. I was uh, 103s freshman year, 112s, then 119s and 135s senior year. So my son was a wrestler for NYU right before COVID. And then he, now he trains oh, wow. wrestlers with nutrition and helps them nice. you know, put on muscle and get into their weight class. And he designs weight training programs for his wrestling club. That's awesome. 
I wanted to wrestle in college. I went to UC Davis and they have a D1 wrestling, but had a D1 wrestling program at the time. I mean, I was set up to like, I should have, I should have been on that team. And I had a, I tore my MCL senior year, like basically like the, the North coast section championships, like second day. That's it was, it was ridiculous. It's okay. I mean, I had, I ended up getting surgery, made a full recovery and ended up playing college lacrosse the way that like college wrestling tryouts worked. I missed it. And it sucks because there was a guy that like was in my kind of district and like, I would just crush him every time. And like, he was still a good wrestler, but I, w- I felt like I was very good wrestler for like, because it's all size adjusted. And I was so small anyways, I would always crush him. And then he like walked onto the team and I'm like, Oh man, if I, what could have been, but right. <laughs> no regrets. But this is a good anyways, segue sorry. for how you know, yes. this is I, now maybe my son will actually listen to this episode. Good. We got we got NFTs for him. We got some wrestling in here. Mm-hmm. Tell him that uh, I've painted a portrait for Jordan Burroughs. Oh, no way. See, even yeah. mom knows who that is. I mean, he's a legend in wrestling for sure. Okay. So how'd you switch from doing art for offices to yep. art for athletes? I always have believed that everything happens for a reason. The art for offices didn't a really solid for me in that it taught me that like focusing on something does like I was getting momentum. And I think if I'd stuck with that, I would probably be the guy like worldwide or whatever, you know, like in a major way, I really believe that that would have been successful. But fate had a different plan for me. And I was delivering art to a client in Las Vegas and met through a mutual friend, this guy named Jared Faison, who used to play in the NFL. Now he manages NFL clients he liked my work and suggested that if I do a couple free paintings for his clients, he would post, you know, make sure that they post and promote it to their teammates. And that would lead to business. And although the art for offices was like, I felt like really getting momentum, I was staying busy, but I wasn't like jam packed, like I couldn't take on new projects, I was still doing passion projects on the side. So I took that time on the side, I did a couple athletes, he set up meetings where I got to meet the players in person. The first one was CJ Anderson, who was playing for the Denver Broncos at the time. Nicest guy ever. And literally, like, I gave him a painting. And then, like, a week later, he bought a painting from me for, like, full price. And so what I ended up doing is I called it strategic gifting, where I would identify players that I thought I could have an impact with. And I can get into kind of how I chose those in a second. But I would make a painting for them, and I would send it to them. And hopefully they would like it and they would post it. And then hopefully their teammates would see it and they would buy one. And I basically built that in as my marketing budget. And so I had like, you know, usually I would do four strategic gifts per month, one a week. And I paint fast. So like on a given year, I also track everything I paint very meticulously in a Google spreadsheet. And every painting is like numbered and front and back documented and signed and dated and everything. But I will basically take over the given year, I'll paint 150 to 200 paintings. And so I'm finishing a painting every one to two days anyways. And so just to take a little bit of that time and dedicate it to as my marketing expense to like the business development and do these strategic gifts. I mean, it's awesome. That's how I grew my business. And like, even to this day, like every single opportunity that I have, that's like a really cool opportunity. I can tie back to like a specific strategic gift that I work for free. So one of the reasons that you're able to be so productive in the art studio is because you have this team managing all those other things like your email, like your accounting, like your packing and shipping the art. You're not spending time doing things that don't need to be done by you. Ironically though, I got to be honest, like that's how I built the business starting like three years ago is when I got into, into the athlete space. I've been painting for six years now total. And so it took some time, but like for that first year of doing those strategic gifts, I still felt like I was in like, I'm in learning mode. I was a one man shop and I was just trying to paint every single day for as long as I could. And like, for me, like that one day a week where I was painting something as a strategic gift, and then I would go and like mail it out. Like that was the marketing for the entire, that was the only market. I didn't have a team yet at all. Mm. And so ironically now too, like I do, I have a way bigger team now. If I wanted to, I could paint 10 hours a day like I used to, but I actually choose to spend my time doing different things. And so that might be, I never used to do podcasts, right? And now like I can make time to like have cool conversations with cool people about art. And like, I like that that is all part of the story too. So I do think like, yes, get employees so that you can spend more time doing the things that you love, but it's also, it's okay if, if that isn't always painting. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be a painter. It just means that there's a lot of different things you could do to make you happy. I'm really glad you shared that, Blake. 
The other thing that I, I want to ask questions about with the strategic gifts, was this so that you could say art in the collection of so-and-so, or it was it more because the art was going to like someone in it who had an influencer type of presence? Great question. So there were some that was, okay, I want to get my hands in this particular athlete because him having my work is a cool thing. But usually those people end up being like the megastars and the megastars. And I learned this through a lot of trial and error. Cause I also had some failed gifts where I made a painting and then I couldn't get a hold of somebody to even get the address mm. or whatever. Right. But you know, it's okay. You know, you shoot your shot. The megastars don't necessarily care about, you know, getting a painting because they have like, you know, Drew Brees has a thousand paintings of himself. Mm. Right. But the way that I was able to work with someone like Drew Brees is I approach those guys totally different, not saying I'm going to do a gift for you. I'm going to say, Hey, I want to do a gift for you. That is going to be a painting of you. And I would love for you to sign it. And I would love it to be donated to whatever charity you want. Oh, right? interesting. So you got their buy-in basically before you created the art. Not at first, but yes, like eventually. Yes. Okay. It took a while to get there. I figured out pretty quickly, like those big guys, unless I have like a really interesting pitch for them, like they're just not going to respond. After I did a couple pieces of work where I couldn't get a hold of the person, I just started reaching out to people ahead of time and saying, Hey, if I do a free painting for you, will you post a picture of it on social media? Like really straightforward. And, and then like, I could say like, by the way, I've done this person and this person and this person. And at first that list was really short. It was the three guys I started with gifting other paintings to with, with Jared. I figured out that like the best target for me was somebody that was a well-respected player in the locker room, definitely a contributor to the team, but not the superstar. Oh, interesting. At all. And also like not somebody that is getting hit up to get free paintings. Like I wanted to be the only guy reaching out to this person at the time of saying like, this is the first time that an athlete like that athlete has ever been hit up by an artist that's, you know, at least doing it full time and like making this like the focus and say like, you're the guy that I want to paint. And they're like, whoa, I've never been painted before. That's the person that you want to find. And then I also learned that like at first, I thought it was so cool if I got these athletes home addresses so I can mail them their art. And I'm like, yeah, I know their home address and nobody else does. Like, I don't know. I thought that was cool. But that mail sometimes like doesn't get opened or like, or like I never really know where it goes. What I learned is if I send it to the training facility where these guys work out, the training facility vets all the mail. They don't want to make sure they're getting some weird creepy or dangerous package. So they'll open all the mail. They see that it's a painting and then they take the painting and they put it in the player's locker. And so I learned over time that a 24 wide by 36 tall painting perfectly fits in an NFL locker. They'll put it up and it'll hang like it'll be below the, the bar of their like hanging pads and clothes. And it like fits perfect. It looks like a billboard. And so like I would find these players, reach out, make sure they're excited make as cool art as I possibly can ship it to the training center. And then like, usually the way that I would end up seeing that is a post on social media from a different player in the locker room. That's like, Whoa, look what Jay just got. This is sick. And like, I would write really big on the side of the canvas. I would write my Instagram handle. And then on the back, I'd put my phone number and then I have a bunch of business cards and stuff, of course, too. You know, there were a handful of times where I got direct text messages that are literally like, hey, this is Antonio Brown. I saw your work in so-and-so's locker. Like, how do I get one of those? That's oh, awesome. That's a this joke. Is, like, this is insane. You're such a genius. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> I try. <laughs> it's like mic drop right <laughs> yeah. now. That's why I said like super transparent. Like there's no reason that an artist couldn't do exactly that. And I think they would be successful as long as like, they're committed to like that niche. And if you want to yeah. jump in sports, I don't care. Like there's so much room for everybody. If you're a really dope artist and you can paint sports athletes, like try this because it will get your art seen with a whole different crowd. I love that you have that abundant attitude. It's like what I say to artists is, you know, somebody likes Mexican food doesn't mean they're committed to one Mexican restaurant. Right. Your website is Blake.art. Yep. Then are your handles on social media all the same? Yeah, Blake Jameson and Jameson is J-A-M-I-E-S-O-N. Okay. And that'll that'll find me on every channel. We will put the links to everything in the show notes. So you can check mm -hmm. out Blake's LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, website, all the places. I think I even can embed the YouTube video if that's the NBC spot. I'm pretty sure we can embed that on into my website as well. All right, Blake, do you have any last words for the listeners before we call this podcast complete? I wish that I had spent more of my nights and weekends doing the thing that would ultimately become my full-time job, which is painting. 
I spent a lot of time watching Netflix or, you know, going out to a bar or whatever, when I could have been getting better at the craft, even just the technical side of things, because I didn't go to art school. And so I just encourage, like, if you like art and it's not your main hustle, just start spending your free time doing that instead of all these other luxury activities that are like, I think time wasters, not that like a good Netflix session is cool. You're, you're tired, you wanna relax or whatever, that's fine. But like as a habit, try to spend more and more of your free time outside of your paid job doing the thing that you love so that you set yourself up so that when you make the leap like I did, you're already at a point where you're ready to sell your art. Cause it took me too long. Like that eight months was, was great. And I needed to spend that time in the studio, but I could have done that sooner. And I wish that I had. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for being with me here today. I will see you the same time, same place next week. Stay inspired. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course on shulmanart.com. 